Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this morning on UK Construction Week. I'm uh, Nathan Garnett. I'm the uh, director for UK Construction Week and uh, delighted to bring you this webinar today where we're looking at how to manage contracts effectively, um, which is obviously a, a massively important topic and uh, really looking forward to today's panel. Before I introduce you to them, I uh, just want to go through this platform in case you haven't used GoToWebinar before. Um, we do want this to be an interactive webinar, so we're really keen to hear from you. So if you want to uh, speak to our panel at the end, you can raise your hand and I can turn on your microphone. Um, or you just type in the questions and I'll put those to um, to our panel as we get towards the end. So introducing you to today's panel. And uh, yeah, firstly, um, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Valeria Cherkasova, who uh, works for the Think Project and has had 15 years of uh, working in the sector on a variety of major projects, UK and international, from Tideway to Crossrail. Um, She's got extensive expertise in contract knowledge and is a is a qualified chartered quantity surveyor. Uh, she also has an MSc in structural design and also a master's in constructional engineering from the University of Cambridge. So uh, welcome, Valeria. How are you? Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, the introduction, Nathan, and a very warm welcome to everyone who was able to join us today. Um, so the webinar, as Nathan already said, will be dedicated to a very uh, high topic, uh, well, very hot topic and high in the agenda. Um, I believe in the most, uh, for the most construction clients, consultants and um, contractors. Um, so I will be chairing today's session and um, contributing to the discussion as well. But I'm joined by, I'm privileged to um, introduce two panelists uh, who are joining me today. They are both very experienced professionals involved in different aspects of contract management. So first is Alan. Alan is involved in upfront management and delivery of contracts and shaping solution for the clients. Um, he spent over 30 years in the industry working for the companies such as Virgin Media, Aircom, Aircom and delivered a substantial knowledge on contracts and currently leading implementation of NEC for contracts across a multi-billion uh, portfolio of Virgin Media. Our second panelist is Teresa. Teresa Mohammed is a partner with um, Travels and Hamlings and she's in the world being a lawyer. Uh, she has a very wide experience in construction disputes. Uh, Teresa in the past assisted her clients and led dispute resolution for significant value and complexity uh, projects. Um, just a bit of housekeeping from me for today. Um, I don't have any fire alarms planned in my house. We all work from home and hopefully the same applies to my other uh, panelists. Um, we won't be taking questions during the discussion. However, as Nathan already mentioned, we want to make this interactive session and we will have some time. Uh, we will uh, allow some time in the end of the session. So please, by all means, feel free to pop them in the chat for the panel. To address in the end. So um, Nathan, uh, if you could go to the first um, slide. So basically, um, we, we talked about um, we talked about the importance of the topic. So the webinar today is sponsored by Think Project UK, a uh, market leader in construction solutions, enabling delivery of complex contracts as well as uh, simpler um, contracts as well. We have various clients. We want to help clients to deliver contracts pain and dispute free, and we have a um, track record of successful implementation of uh, of our prime product called CMA in the UK. However, our offering also includes, um, if we could go to the next slide, please, um, also includes some other products. So today, what we would like to cover is um, we would like to look at the uh, important topic of contract management and how we can deliver uh, contract management in the most efficient and pain-free way. Um, we recently released a new white paper, um, which um, you can see on the screen currently. It's available for download for free. Um, please feel free to get yourself a copy. Um, we call it delivering transparency, simplification and clarity because we believe even if the contracts are very complex, they still deserve to be treated as something which you would like to use and, uh, and see as user-friendly tool for yourself. 
So the, the white paper in general explores the management and governance of construction projects uh, for the following stages of, um, of four, four, uh, four different stages of contract management life cycle. Um, so additionally, what, uh, what it does, it investigates on the roles and responsibilities existing in the industry and also addresses how lack of contract management competence can be tackled with technology, uh, which is our expertise. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, these are questions we, um, I think we're going to focus on today. We're going to remain on this slide for a while. Um, so we, we'd like to talk about all um, these important um, um, parts of the, I guess, of this whole story for today. Uh, first of all, we, we would like to understand what is contract management and hopefully with my panel we can we can answer this question looking at different perspective, uh, perspectives of contract management and different angles. Uh, also, what is the best practice for contract management? What good looks like? Um, how we manage contracts in the UK? Because we do have um, various contractors working in the UK market, coming from different uh, various countries in Europe and um, the um, US as well. How differently contract management looks <clears throat> in the UK and how do we do it here? And also, <clears throat> apologies. Uh, and also what we would like to look at is how can we change and support uh, contract management with the use of digital tools, how technology can em enable better understanding of contracts and delivery of contracts. So on that note, I actually would like <clears throat> to jump to the very first question. And um, for me, I, it was really interesting to understand. I, I, I've done a bit of research, obviously. We, we we produced the white paper recently and we wanted to understand what is what is contract management um, and why why is it that important so i found i'm going to read out the uh wikipedia um um uh, i guess i mean version of contract management and what it is so what wikipedia says is contract management is the process of managing contracts that are ma made as part of the delivery of a built asset it involves the creation, analysis, and execution of contracts by the parties to those contracts to ensure operational and financial performance is maximized and risks are minimized. So very simple, but at the same time, I think it's uh, it's very confusing because it involves it combines lots of different uh, things in it. It looks simple, but it's not simple to achieve. Um, I, I guess. Every person involved in uh, any sort of delivery of construction contract, or like Teresa, who's actually uh, reviewing what went wrong on um, um, on projects and how it ended up being in in a formal dispute, will answer the question that it's not as simple. So I think again, looking at um, the structure, we can probably identify three parts, which is pre-contract phase contract execution phase and all support uh, post to work phase when we when we start delivering and complying with the contract. So in my view, just from me personally, um, I think this definition uh, largely lacks the inclusion of life cycle intention when contracts um, have that organic continuity from drafting the contract into delivery and um, and passing that asset into operation. But I'd like to hear from the panel, from my panel today, and understand what what they see, why why it's not as easy to deliver a construction contract when um, obviously um, the description on Wikipedia tells us is as simple as that. Um, I don't know, but I'd like to probably ask Alan first, just because he is the man who's involved in in upfront delivery and obviously drafting of contracts. Yeah, thank I'll you. Um, yes, I mean, my background, uh, certainly uh, in contracting uh, very many moons ago, then consultancy preparation of contract documents, and then into the client side, really, for the last 20 odd years uh, with Virgin Media. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it is quite a complex science. Um, uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I often um, break it down into five or six component parts. There's obviously the legal terms and conditions and uh, there are various flavours uh, that we've all used over the years. 
um, how we composite then um, the, uh, the this, what is now called a scope, or uh, I used to call it specifications, drawings, frameworks, etc. All these are key elements in terms of defining what needs to happen under that contract, and they are elements that uh, perhaps if they're not put together as well or, or, or accomplished, then we then start to get into a um, uh, sort of problem areas and then we start to look and turn perhaps our possibly the contract wording and what should folks have done at the right times uh, and, and so on and so forth so yeah quite a, a complex uh, area to compile as a client uh, you know we would certainly run into something in the order of 20 subsections of areas you know for health and safety environmental drawing specifications and so on that actually comprise everything that actually uh, our contractor partners have to execute even during the course of the work. So uh, I totally echo your point, Valeria, about the pre-contract. I mean, that's probably, for me, the most critical phase is getting it right up front uh, and agreeing those terms, agreeing those sort of tender and RFP processes so that we can, at the point of uh, signing, you know, have a comfort factor between both client and uh, contractor partner uh, as to what we are about to embark on and set out to achieve. And how often, how often do you involve someone like Teresa? I'd like to hear a little bit from her because obviously we get that knowledge and expertise of lawyers involved in disputes and uh, a lot of this knowledge is coming from unfortunately not the best situations we can, we can observe in construction when companies losing money and um, getting into formal disputes. Um, Teresa, would you like to comment on that? So I'd really love to hear from you and your perspective are you actually involved in any uh, upfront work with contracts yes thankfully um these days we are and alan's point is exactly right and i agree with him in that it's the planning and the procurement and the letting of these contracts that is really crucial and unfortunately what will happen is if this is all done in a rush if it's you know an unfortunate case of a race to the bottom cheapest wins um you often get problems and from my perspective um what we have is contract management can mean a couple of things and i think that alan highlighted very well the complexity of this and so did you because for me what happens is the contract doesn't necessarily or isn't necessarily fully thought out um and carefully planned with the works in mind always so we have contract terms over here and we have the more technical construction stuff over there and the two don't necessarily work well together and professionals are trying to deliver complex projects with huge constraints particularly now with labor costs payroll costs you know, all of the stuff that's going on in the world right now and then you'll have some lawyer pop up and go have you observed the payment processes and they'll go what, what are you talking about we're trying to deliver a massive project over here you know so i think that's that's part of the problem so with, with contract management what i understand that to mean is you know almost like what that definition said, you know, effectively observing your rights and responsibilities and ex executing them under the contract. And that's both parties doing that. Now, if you're, you know, and the classic line from you know, everyone's client has said this, the contract's in a draw. And, and when you have scenarios like that, it's no wonder that parties are struggling to, you know, properly administer contracts and have the resource to do that and deliver these massive projects under extreme pressure. Absolutely. I mean, that leads us to the, actually to the next question very nicely, because um, um, what does good look like and why why these co contracts are that complex? Why do we have contracts which contain multiple pages and um, uh, large books of information and um, a lot of pages? So why can't we go and deliver something with much less in more plain language? Because when we run a little study for the white paper, what we actually realized, and that was general feedback from all construction professionals involved in delivery and drafting of the contracts, that they're complex and large in volume. This is a uh, literal quote from people. They read written not in plain language, so some people don't really understand it. Confusing and ambiguous. And all these um, kind of named issues uh, mostly stem out of the of the fact that these are not standard forms of contracts anymore because they they have those deviations as well so as you said people get involved trying to get something stick something into the contract where they can see maybe they've done it in the past and it worked but it not necessarily works but creates instead of creating a bigger opportunity creates a bigger issue so is therefore i have a question i guess to both of you 
Um, so how does that affect the best practice and how can we, do we need to standardize contracts or do we actually need to make sure that we still have that flexibility? Well, uh, I'll kick off. I mean, um, you know, if I look at the last 20 years, we um, we, we we ran actually with an IC SEMF, which is really, uh, you know, client, contractor, engineer, relatively dated, re relatively adversarial type of format, which to some extent, uh, going back uh, many moons to Latham and Egan in the 90s, the uh, precursor that in, in reality sort of set the institutional civil engineers onto the NEC uh, path of um, you know far more level playing field of approach of contracts. Um, so we 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 run with those, and I think your point was well made that I think uh, every time we had a little bit of hiccup, we wrote a clause to make sure that we didn't fall into that particular hole again. And I think that's you know that was would be human nature. That would be the right uh, professional advice from our legal advisors and so on and so forth. And you know guess what? As even as engineers, we're fairly straight up guys, we don't want to do things twice when uh, once we'll do and you certainly don't want to uh, fall into a trap. So I think um, those then can complicate. And I think that the problem we then tend to find is you, you start to boil a plate a bit of a, uh, sort of the T's and C's side of things, because because in back to my earlier point, the scope is unique to the works. And that really, to some extent, as, as long as that's well-defined and is, should we say, un understood in engineering and costing terms, then are we possibly still think uh, arguing here over whether it's the terms and conditions and, and, the, and the, the legal obligations and the, the everyday contractual management that flows from those obligations that are probably more problematic and in question rather than the physical works to be built as long as those of course are described properly and it is understood what needs to happen. So I think there is scope creep when we use the bespoke terms and then just to round off that probably is then why we took a uh, a long hard look at ourselves and then went towards uh, NEC4 to level that playing field somewhat but even then you know there are some uh, times where we client side perhaps do amend away from vanilla flavor as we call it uh, and, and, and that is a little bit of aging that's a little bit of client um, sort of caution possibly you know uh, and, and then, then just uh, you know ceding to perhaps professional advice when we do construct even you know standard term contracts as it were. Absolutely. Well, I, I'd like to hear from uh, maybe playing a little bit of demo advocate. I'm trying to hear from Teresa if there are some <clears> real <throat> examples of uh, disasters caused by um, by amendments in contracts. Yeah, so we've all probably heard of the cases where, you know, there's been some awful amendment that's meant that you know, contracts are unenforceable or parts of them, such as liquidated damages, provisions, things like that. We've heard those horror stories. But I guess more generally, um, you know, bringing this back to the original point you know you don't need all these amendments do you I mean you really don't you don't need to heavily amend these contracts but the reason people do it is because of a lack of trust and, and concern and a lack of collaboration and if you're worried about any of those things you do exactly as Alan described and you try and account for every particular scenario particularly any bad experience you've had you always try and put in an amendment that will alleviate that problem and then you end up with you know amendments that big um, or that big and and no one can really navigate them but you're absolutely right you know we've all seen like i was looking at a contract last week which you know attempts to put uh, you know every possible risk damage loss everything on a contractor that obviously couldn't meet that bill you know obviously could never anticipate or account for the the huge amount of damages that you know another party is trying to impose on them and so a lot of the more experienced construction lawyers will say to you well that's ridiculous provision you know you can't the market can't take that you'll never be able to actually meet that so why would you even bother trying to negotiate that and so that's what a lot of you know non contentious colleagues will will do and try and persuade parties that don't even for that because it's just silly but yeah like you say we do we do see that unfortunately in the sector and you know I think parties feel under pressure to sign up to it because they really want the work and then we all know that they won't be able to adhere to those provisions um, so you, you're almost in breach before you start but in terms of you know really getting into what a good sort of practice would be it's you know understanding the contract for a start so even if you haven't got all those you know huge amendments that are very sort of geared in one particular way it actually is surprising and I think you made that point that a lot of parties just don't understand these forms of contract but there is actually a lot of training out there that you can have 
for free or very low cost to try and because it isn't a natural thing getting to grips with these things you know it, it does take people quite a long time um and i think the key thing for me which i i would say is understanding risks and how you deal with you know nip disputes in the bud before they become a big issue because understanding how your dispute escalation provisions work is really key to this because the thing is they do work they do eradicate disputes they force you to communicate and discuss risk and although it is a bit painful it actually sort you know avoids you having to talk to someone like me so you know at the risk of doing myself out of a job i think that if parties were a bit more familiar with those processes and how they work and that the fact they probably do exist in their contracts um that would really really help and also just things like um you know frequent training both parties so not just how to make claims against each other a collaborative contractual training you know workshops discussing problems and how you can alleviate them um all together is actually a really good idea because it's not about pitting party a against party b it's how do we successfully deliver this project because that's the most important thing um and if you try and do it together you would be surprised i mean i've, I've seen it myself and it actually you know initially people aren't so trusting but then once you start discussing these things you realize there's so much synergy between you and for me that's that's the thing not having you know reams and reams of amendments i think you're um, on that Theresa, if i may just to pick up on a couple of those points um and and and, and there's actually perfect little lead-ins you know to just to come back on um you know, from the training side of things um, you know, as a client, you know, we set out about training our own people, our own, con and, but we bring in our contractor partners to the same training. And that's not about, um, you know, necessarily steering in the right direction in the sense of to avoid certain things. This actually is to be transparent, to talk through some of the things we do. To some extent, uh, you know, but to me, the contracts are quite generic. You know, it's a very simple piece of work we do. We basically dig everybody's roads up, I'm, I'm afraid, and then we put our services in. But it's not building a unique power station or a bridge or a flood alleviation scheme or whatever, which has its uniqueness. So there is repetition. So that makes our operations quite simple. But again, you know, being transparent, offering that, and indeed inviting and insisting to some extent that our contractor partners come along to that training, sets off that sort of um, that sort of journey, uh, collaboration journey well. And certainly, uh, again, to pick up on your point, Theresa, you know, back to the core clause of the NEC4 early warnings. What does that tell us? We've got a problem, Houston. Let's have a look at it quickly and we get on with it. And it's that collaboration, communication. And again, you know, the contract will tell us things to do and doubtless we can't in a while. The SEMA support, you know, clearly, exercises us to do that by way of prompts even if we're not very good at uh, doing things in time you know we have tools now that really help us which i'm sure we'll, we'll come on to in, in, in a while this is a great point i mean what Teresa just um i think um touched on is uh, is very interesting um part of training because mm -hmm. you you tend to think about formal training um again so if we if we start talking about our next question which is how do we manage contracts in the uk if you think about the uk and how we looked at the contracts and why in general there is uh, there's this idea that the contract is always in your drawer and you very rarely look at it before you start having issues on site. I think this is a great example of how we neglect, uh, in, in, um, I, I think basically neglected uh, contract management in the UK at least um, in, in the past. So I, I agree there is, a, there is that formal piece of training which is required, but I really like this idea. I think what Teresa just touched on is is that great idea of sharing and almost having a live, uh, I don't know, mock of having conversation about something. Because when I worked on site, you quite often see people um, actually um, coming up and saying, oh, they, they're not going to agree to that. We're going to go into formal dispute. So people don't understand the extent of it. So they don't understand quite often the cost of it, implications of it reputational risk and everything so before they make that decision and I think educating people equally on site and giving them an idea that it's not as easy it's not as straightforward because people hear adjudication as well and they think that adjudication is going to obviously solve every single problem for them but it's also increasingly expensive I mean we're having people working on site um, doing all sorts of different jobs and my uh, I, I guess my point when we started talking about this particular example is how do we enable that? So how can we make it happen? Because Teresa, you are a great mentor, you're involved in lots of this work with contractors and that's how um, how we we came across each other in the past. So is, is this something you um, 
um, you could, I, I don't know, you could you could lead um, as as kind of as lawyers in the industry, or that should come from from both parties. So how how that can be enabled? Well, I think you know yes we can but the parties also can do that too and i think you know a great time to start is right at the beginning when everyone's still friends you know when everyone's still enthused about the work being awarded and the excitement of the project starting i think it's a great opportunity to start that because one thing i've heard loads of and anna's probably heard it as well is that you know all of a sudden people start saying things like you know a year or so in when things may not be going to plan oh i'm going to start being contractual well, you've, you've always meant to have been contractual. <laughs> it's as the contract, you know, and, and you can tell that people's positions start to change and parties start to change. And this is a lot to do with behaviours. This is what it's all about, really. And so, actually, if you get that right at the start and get people used to exactly as the NEC anticipates, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, you know, it's a, it's a drag, it's so resource heavy, we have to send so many notices. But actually, as Alan points out, it's a really good way of flushing out problems very early so that how do we deal with this? rather than saving it up for some point where everyone's become entrenched. So if you do, I think if you've, you know, the lawyers can obviously facilitate it, but so can the parties and do it from the beginning. And then everyone's used to it and you don't get into this, everyone taking positions, assuming things, you know, that's, that's what's really damaging. And I think the thing with adjudication, of course, adjudication is so effective for so many reasons. But I also think that if you are doing things, you know, based on, a technical failure to issue a pay less or you know if if a massive dispute starts over those sorts of things you must recognize you're going to damage the commercial relationship between the parties you are going to severely damage trust between you that is what is going to happen and so rather than do that over something that may not you know be you know that might of course it may not be trifling it might be a lot of money at stake but instead of doing that as your first point of call what about actually having workshops having regular communication talking about problems first um just you know just a thought <laughs> but to do yeah. it we, we still need we still need effective information sharing i think what is missing currently is that everyone keeps that little piece of information on their local computer and people can access it only with certain permission or you may in fact have completely different view of the subject just because you're not sharing that knowledge together you don't have that uh, piece of information which will deliver exactly the same information to you, me and Alan, and we, we would be happy to review together, discuss it, and that there won't be anything invisible. Um, I guess, so is, is this something you can see, um, Teresa, I think it's probably a question to you as well as a, you know, as a lawyer looking at this information post factum and, and trying to find um, some truths in it. So how difficult is that? For us, it's it's the key to it. And it, and it actually resolves disputes. So it's particularly uh, relevant in the building safety context, of course, in terms of record keeping, the golden thread. So all of this has been looked at again, obviously, very recently. We all know why. But actually having effective data, record keeping, being able to access things quickly to show what's happened or what is happening is absolutely crucial because the minute you can do that, dispute takes a completely different shape. Because if you can, as a matter of fact, say this happened on this day and here is the record to prove that, or this is how we did something, you instructed us in this way, you know, it just shuts it right down and you can probably negotiate settlements or resolutions of little things as you go along. What happens, you know, otherwise is you end up with this nightmare of nobody knows where the documents are they're saved on all these different local computers everywhere it's you know there are multi you know a lot of construction cases as you'll be aware have thousands of documents hundreds of thousands of electronic documents stored in all sorts of places and that's when you end up racking up massive costs trying to retrieve that information and of course in an adjudication context you are done for because how are you going to get hold of all that and amass it and, and analyze it properly um and it also, sorry, uh, I'll let Alan jump in in a minute. It, it, it's also relevant to the risk advice you will get too, because if you've got excellent records and you know you maintain them and you can access them, they're properly organised. Not only does it halve your costs, I mean, or even less. I mean, there might be reduced write down, but you can probably get risk advice because you can properly say, okay, these are the documents on this issue. This issue. What what do you think? Whereas if you what you're doing is having to sort of try and amass hundreds of thousands of documents from various sites, different people, people who may have left the business you know it's very difficult for people to advise you as to risk because they just don't know what's out there whereas at least if you can do it in an organized way then you can say okay that is a good claim that's not a good claim for example absolutely and Alan for you as well I mean how how do we stop 
his issues getting into disputes. So what do we do currently to share that information effectively? Yeah, I, I think again, picking up a number of points there. Just the very last one, um, you know, we the, the risk register is such a vital document. You know, we, you know, if you sneeze, if it's worth putting on a risk register, put it on. We'll spend two minutes talking about the sneeze. It doesn't need to be on, and therefore we move on. But you know, we're you know diminishing it. You know that it, it has that um, space and a place you can. Uh, you can score it in the sense of uh, likelihood and gravity and so on. And all of a sudden you can then start to get to the more important aspects uh, and focus on them in priority level terms. Um, so very key, I think also um, client, you know, back of the payment problems, client understanding of uh, payments, uh, because you know, in a way I have all of the NEC thought, just assumes the client will pay once it's certified and off, off it goes. And there's an, a base assumption that, you know, the, that should happen. Of course, it should. Doesn't mean it, and of course, there are some remedies if it doesn't. Um, so I think client education is is key. And, and I think I've seen this in, in previous life, uh, you know, in, in the consultancy side. Uh, if you didn't have uh, perhaps um, uh, a construction focused or, or, or a client with some construction awareness, um, then you really, they were in your, the lap of your gods, as it were, and, and, and you, you could guide them or, or not guide them, more importantly. And I think that's possibly where um, it, it, it comes into play. And, and back to the earlier points, then, I mean, when I started um, construction, you know, the hard copy correspondence file on the agent's back shelf of his cupboard was the Bible. If it wasn't in there, it didn't exist in very commas. And I think probably in the last 25 odd years, uh, certainly since we've come into the uh, with the Virgin Media Hub into the NEC sort of structure um, yes we've had that problem with x number of people having word excel powerpoints databases Joe's left the business he's taken all his emails with him how on earth do you assimilate what may have, well, have happened was no if you do use the, the, the soft tools and you know you can run a report that actually gives you chapter and verse between date x and date y and to some extent it it can provide somebody reviewing that, you know, whether it's may not have got to dispute resolution sort of stage, but it gives somebody, you know, a really good viewpoint on the high ground who has probably discharged their functions uh, at the right time with the right data, you know, in, when it comes to actually assessing you know, what may well have gone right and wrong and how well it's been managed in that process. Absolutely. I mean, that le that leads us to the final question, and I think we already started talking about that, but in general, we, as part of the white paper, we actually run an interesting study with um, seven professionals working in construction. We asked all of them uh, what was their experience before they used um, a system which would operate contract management for them and keep not just information, not just document, but in general provide that access to the single truth of information and help them to manage um, contracts such as achieving compliance of the contracts, achieving uh, uh, ticking the boxes in terms of contractual obligations. So um, there are great benefits, which I, I'm actually going to demonstrate later. Please stay with us. Don't um, don't leave the webinar until, until that slide. But before we do that, <clears throat> Are there any personal examples where you you've seen that being implemented, where you actually um, physically touched on something which was in one place, in one system? Um, when it, does that actually exist in you, in your current jobs? Did you come across any of these examples? Well, we're certainly using uh, CMAP because it is a support system to NEC. Uh, everybody knows that. Uh, you know, one or two other products for sure. Uh, and even as a client, we, we have a little nibble at whether we can create our own equivalent CMAP, you know, and, and so on and so forth. But you know, ultimately, all it is doing is um, making soft your communication uh, exchange, uh, and it ensures or it guides you. Um, you know, you, you, at the end of the day, it's it's the guy that's got to write the data that inputs into a system that is doing the action. Uh, but I think you know the the um, the soft prompts. Uh, you know, I think I, I, when we were re reviewing whether to use it, somebody once said, "Look, I now log into my CMA page first and before I go into my emails." And I think that's the sort of size change where you're using a system to manage your process, and it's about contract management. And that's what we've seen, um, you know, with with our various project managers around the UK, you know, across 30 odd contracts and so on and so forth, is that you've sort of you, you've pushed the agenda towards people, you know, effectively being forced to manage 
contracts better, but ultimately the penny drops, and actually you do see then the benefit of the tools in making your system, your process better. So a little bit of upfront pain delivers a medium to long term gain. That's very good. And um, for you, Teresa, tell me if, I, if there is anything in your experience where you've seen that great system in place working. <laughs> That's true. It, it does actually, and I agree with Alan. It can be a bit painful to start with when you try and persuade people to change, but it, then they, they really appreciate it. So, it, in in the context of a live project that might be dealing with risk issues and minor disputes, you can literally pinpoint to what's costing the money. You know what what is causing the you know concerns. What documents you know were, were able you know you were able to retrieve. What the delays were. You know all that kind of stuff. For example, when clients are looking at you know, why are projects overrunning? Why are the costs increasing? Using that kind of thing, you know, any kind of digital product that allows you to access that information in real time or keep it, you know, stored so that you can retrieve it is, is amazing. And, and, the, and there is a world, you know, world of difference between that and then, you know, what Alan was describing, which is, you know, when everyone's got their own accounts and nobody's synced and nobody knows where versions of things are. I mean, you know, for example, not that long ago, I would say less than 10 years ago, you might have, you know, multi-million pound infrastructure projects where people wouldn't know which one was the accepted program. You know, the, <laughs> you know that that sounds unbelievable, but it, it, you know, it was a thing. So, or, or you know, what was the executed? Where was the executed version of the contract? You know, that used to be a thing. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Well, all, all of us, I'm sure, have those examples uh, from from their professional life. When when you tend to think that people people you're asking for this information should know where it is, but then you you being supplied with a lot of, um, as Alan said, paper data sometimes, which doesn't have any connection to each other, and um, and certainly you have to find a way to interpret it and also trust people who produced that information and whether whether it was um, an actual use, u, uh, useful data or something, some pe people just dumped and stored for, for a long time. Um, absolutely. I think on that point, um, we've covered all those four questions, but I, what I was going to touch on is just to obviously demonstrate the product we're providing as a sync project um, um, in our overall portfolio, because we, we do manage a lot of different things. But I think what is really interesting is that project control pillar you can see on the right hand side, which provides SEMA and another product, which is TP control. So in terms of SEMA, it's not just it's not just managing information, but thinking about the resource scarcity we have in the industry. Um, uh, Nathan, if you can go to the next slide, um, we, we're not just trying to manage information because that information requires management, but we're also trying to manage the the resource, the skill we have in the industry, which which is um, again high in the agenda, and sometimes we're struggling to find people to fulfil those roles. And again, we talked about education. We talked about the fact that we're trying to um, uh, provide um, that base where people know what they're doing on site, how they're operating, what they're providing. I think. With SEMA, certainly, you can rely on the system. It's professional, it's consistent, it, it is effective environment. It also uh, does provide you real-time reporting. It provides you with the information you can trust. As Alan said, you can log in and see what other people are doing in the system and how they operate in the system. Uh, whether you know someone signs something, you, you can see you can see a timestamp immediately. So on that slide, you can definitely see if if this is your reality. So that the solution of SEMA can definitely support you with that. And um, as I promised, so um, if we could jump on the um, next slide, I think this these are great examples. Uh, this is a study, as I mentioned. So we only had this very small group of people. We had seven people, seven professionals. We ran uh, interviews, um, uh, private interviews with with each of these um, uh, individuals, and we don't really. We were surprised to see how common those trends were uh, when we were talking to those people. But in general, it's not just monetary benefit of using system like SEMA. So we could talk about other. Uh, tools uh, used in construction, but in general, you can achieve great saving. You can achieve saving in your staff as well and employing less people uh, when we talked about that um, resource scarcity. But also two points which I highlighted in green are your reputational risks as well, and also improving the way you're managing the information. Sometimes you cannot necessarily address it and say, okay, so I'm saving that much money because I'm using 
system like SEMA, but it gives you that, um, I guess, peace of mind when you think about how you manage it, where you're going to find it tomorrow. If someone is leaving the job and you're picking up it today, whether it is uh, um, truth or this is something else and you need to start going through that information again. So again, all this information is available in our white paper. So we, we, we are actually sharing it with the wider audience. If, they, if there are any comments or suggestions, I'm, we, we're more than happy to take it on board. Please feel free to email us. And if there are any comments as well, we, we're more than welcome to review that. But on that note, um, if there are no, I mean, obviously um, from Teresa and um, Alan, if there are no comments at that stage, uh, should we take some questions from, from people attending the webinar? Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Valeria. Thanks, Teresa and Alan. That was great. And we've got quite a few questions that have come in, but obviously if people want to keep those coming, um, we have got a little bit of time to do some of those. So um, the first one was from Paul. Actually, I think you were just mentioning it there, Val, uh, where, where or how can people get access to the white paper? So you're, you're going to be sharing that, I think you said. Yeah, we, sh we share the white paper as well as it could be downloaded from our website. We're more than welcome to send um, as part of the um, uh, information pack, we'll be sending white paper and slides as well. So yeah, everyone who attended the webinar will receive a copy of that. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. That's great. There's, there's three or four people have sort of asked a very similar question, um, which is around contract management. Um, so, so Subash said, one of the key issues around contract management is the behaviours around contracts and whether they're collaborative or punitive forms of contracts. Um, and I think you've kind of covered this in, in talking about perhaps more, they should more be collaborative nowadays. But Alan, I think you were nodding. Is that, uh, so what, what uh, yeah, what's your feedback on that? I mean, do you still see some that are more punitive? No, I mean, we, we have, you know, swung the pendulum in really over to a more collaborative approach. Um, and I always pull out, you know, clause 10 to uh, mutual trust and cooperation. And, um, you know, we're going into training mode. If I'm training somebody, I have, a, I have one sheet of paper on that wall. And the minute we get into a situation of a discussion over a point, I just point to mutual trust collaboration. Are we on that page, guys? And do we want to do this? And I think it's such a vital in part, you know, if, we're, if both parties are on that agenda, then even when things do happen, you know, we do know there are remedies and abilities to recover uh, unforeseen costs and so on and so forth. You know, in the contract, and as long as we are both prepared to move it forward and on that on that on that trajectory on that journey, then there's no reason why you can't uh, you know collaborate well. So we have moved a little bit away, uh, you know, from a more adversarial or, or, or parties driven, uh, less uh, partnering type of approach. Cool. And and Teresa, I mean, one of the questions here, maybe this is linked to it as well, but one of the questions is. Uh, in your experience, what's the most common failure of contracts that, that lead to dispute? I would say it's not necessarily the contract itself. It's a lack of understanding of, of rights and responsibilities under it. So not understanding when you're supposed to do something um, or not do something, not adhering to timelines, um, not communicating, flagging up risks, things like that. It's, it's, for me, it's less about the form of contract. It's it's the attitude that goes with it and understanding what it is you've signed up to. Okay, cool. Um, I hope that answers your question, Tarek. And a couple of other questions on a similar sort of theme here as well. Um, what are the pitfalls of using contract management tools on complex multinational projects, um, given that contracts are managed differently in the UK and maybe outside the UK? So. Uh, I think Alan, maybe would you be able to answer that one? No, I, I'm on weak ground. Um, uh, my uh, international experience extends to Southern Ireland only, and that was more closely linked to uh, UK. Uh, so I, I, I've not a lot. I'm not got personal experience. I've obviously read around uh, a lot. I, I think it would be extremely complex. I, I, whether I can give away to trees on this one, possibly for third experience, but I, I couldn't probably comment so heavily on international and FIDIC and so on. I can, I can actually provide some comments on that because as part, again, of the white paper, you will find a great example. We've, we've done the research in terms of what Teresa touched on is important piece of education and how we're providing the right skills to manage those contracts. So, for example, if you look at the comparison of the UK and Europe, 
where in Europe the project manager in general will be leading that contract management piece. In the UK we have obviously a specific role of quant surveyor and quant surveyor increasingly more and more involved in that contract management piece which never existed in the past and I think equally you have probably gaps in Europe and you have gaps in the UK but I think what we find with NEC contracts in particular it's way more structured, it's way more collaborative it's it's probably easier to understand if you if you take some of the international contracts you will be able to um i mean it's difficult to understand them to start with but uh in the delivery they could be uh, also increasingly um difficult to manage i think we are lucky in the uk because we have that uh, strength of having consistent contracts but yeah it's i guess it's different for everyone uh, obviously um pms in europe will be learning on the job in the uk i guess QS is more and more getting involved because they, they have that base knowledge and they have that understanding of the contract um, coming coming out of the universities, I guess, and, and bringing that knowledge to the side. Um, but yeah, there's certain, certainly a difference. Okay. Um, does anyone else want to chip in on that, on that question? Uh, I mean, I've got another one here, which is uh, perhaps is um, for you, Theresa. Um, with around detail so Tarek has asked um we rarely have all the detail when we when we're putting together a tender um what would you advise me maybe is the best way of doing that should you do it on a piecemeal basis when when the, the various projects come up um or is there another way perhaps of, of doing that yeah so i i completely understand that Point and where you're coming from there it's very difficult because if you're the one tendering for the work and you're responding to the information you've been given what what can you do and that's why you know you do find parties making assumptions carving things out doing things bit by bit but of course that's tricky because you don't know what's coming so you, you can't sort of you know you're trying to adjust your position for unknowns that you know may change to commercial benefits or you know otherwise so I think it's really difficult but that I think I appreciate this isn't you know, giving you the you know, the answer perhaps but that is the point the point is and I think Alan made this point and this has come out you know loud and clear in the in the so for example the, the building safety reforms that curing things properly is absolutely key and that means giving people all the information and taking the time to go through it and properly price and program it now if that's not happening you you are starting off on a bad foot immediately and that is going to mean that disputes are far more likely. So, uh, but then I you know, take the point that if you're the one, if you're the contractor or subcontractor trying to win work, you know, you're not able to control that. So it's it's an invidious position. But yes, I, I've seen many contractors in, or subbies in that instance, they price for what they know and they can't price for what they don't. So. Yeah. And I guess, you know, now I think we said at the beginning is, you know, very more, even more pertinent with costs and, um, people not necessarily be having a crystal ball as to what's going to happen in the next few months. So, I mean, what, what was the sort of um, advice there? I guess is, you know, what, what, what do you say to people who, who um, you know, who are worried about costing themselves out of a project? Well, the, the trouble is, if you if you go in cheap, as a, as a practice has, we've all known about it in the sector. If you try and buy work, you know, you're always going to end up in a payment dispute. That is a given. Because if you're buying the work with the hope of getting it back somewhere else through variations or uh, any other claims, you you know that disputes are coming. That is that is that is what is going to happen. So, you know, you either make the risk, you take the calculated risk that we're going to buy this piece of work in the hope that there will be a pipeline of lots of amazing projects that you can get involved in. But you know, you, if you're starting off compromising yourself commercially, particularly with what we're looking at, you know, seeing with materials and labour costs. You, you're pretty much certain you're going to get in a payment dispute. Cool. I think what Tarek's um, point he's just put in here as well, um, the issue is not uh, how to settle disputes but to avoid disputes when we but when we have to start without all the information. Um, so yeah I guess that's that's uh, I think what would you it's important that um, clients are briefed by if they've got advisors along these lines because um, with the client hat on, <clears throat> I'll absolutely invite the 
tendering contractors to provide the clarity on the assumptions they made and to some extent put some financial number into it so that we can actually get a feel for you know a 10 million project with a 2 million uh, risk factor is telling us something wrong with our contract documentation that's just a big too big a number and so you know how can you get the science behind the tendering assumptions you know and, and, and you know if you don't invite that science to be given to you you know, and, and make then the right decisions. Um, you know, because I echo the point uh, Theresa made over the, you know, the, the, the buying work. You know, should clients be mature enough not to accept the lowest bid? And certainly, if it's by some margin, you know, uh, you know, there's enough people out there that have got that experience to know that invariably, uh, more often than not, as I say, it may well end up in a sort of um, a, a bad place. Cool. All right. Um, I've got a question for you, Valeria. This has uh, come from David. He says, um, does Think Project explore lean management skills used in contract management? Well, we, we, we do have um, a lot of um, different, um, uh, it depends what, what David means by lean, lean management skills. So I guess we, we do have uh, different expertise. It depends what we're going to apply it to because different clients prefer different um a different strategy and different uh different product so i guess the best thing about uh, SEMA and think project is that we can tailor those solutions um depending on the needs of the client because um we, we're not trying to sell everything to everyone um, um as uh, alan said before every client will need um their their own part for um applicable to their delivery and to their projects so yeah, I, I'm more than uh, happy to cover that in more detail if David can expand on that. But yeah, absolutely. Good. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, I think Trey, this is one for you. It, Robert has said um, historically emails were not considered legal documents. Following earlier discussions, putting together information in a claim situation, are emails now considered legal contractual documents? Yeah, potentially. Um, I think it. What you might have is notice provisions that stipulate how a notice is meant to be served. So that's always important to check. So if you are serving any kind of notice or certificates or anything, any sort of contractual document, so as in sending it to, from one party to another or any kind of communication between you. So if you're required to give early warnings or anything like that, you need to look at the communication clause or the notice provisions clause, which will tell you whether you can do it by email. And um, yeah, generally speaking, all sorts of things are sent by email now, and that's perfectly fine. And in terms of evidence, again, like lots of things are recorded by email. So you may be discussing something on site and then go back and send an email, you know, just referring to what you discussed. That to me is is evidence. So yeah, not, not a problem with emails, unless you, you know, you are told that otherwise. So, you know, the contract might say that you have to send things by first class post. Um, I mean, that's getting pretty you know old-fashioned now but sometimes it does say things like that um, and in which case if you were serving a notice then I would always say stick slavishly to what the what the notifications say. Brilliant cool okay um, well I think that's kind of answered most of the questions that have come in so uh, I think you've covered I think every... we have one one slide Nathan where we just yeah. wanted to mention that we we are um, we are happy to invite everyone to another webinar as well, which is going to take place, I think, oh, I'm not entirely sure, probably hidden. Um, so uh, apologies for that. So we, we will send it as part of the pack, but we have another webinar taking place uh, in around May time, which will talk about um, importance of analytics and how we can enable analytics for your uh, individual needs and um, obviously, uh, I, that's the slide. Thank you so much. So how how you can enable um, better understanding of your contracts and where you're heading with your delivery by using analytics in SEMA and also we implemented Power BI recently. We would like to demonstrate some great examples. So this will be case study approach, uh, which is hopefully going to be exciting and full of real um, projects things are this webinar as well we're going to share more information on the website in the next few weeks um and Brilliant. i guess on that note from myself personally i'd like to thank my um, my uh, absolutely amazing panel today so teresa and alan thank you so much for your time and for sharing your um great experience and knowledge with with us today
Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you to me, Alan and Teresa and Val. Um, and I, I'm, I guess also, apart from the next webinar, we're looking forward to seeing you at UK Construction Week in May um, at Excel. So if people want to come and meet you and the team, they can come down and, and we'll, we'll be at Excel for three days from the 3rd to the 5th of May. So if you go to ukconstructionweek.com, um, you can register for your free pass as well. So we look forward to meeting you there. Um, so thank you very much, thank everyone. And this has been recorded, so we'll send everyone the link and they can watch it back or they'll be able to share it with colleagues as well. So hopefully that's uh, really useful stuff. But thank you very much, Alan, Teresa and Val. Thank okay. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.